All right, here we're going to go into video number two. Here we go. Let's do this. Uh, I've got two questions that are actually very closely related to each other, and I think I can kind of tackle them. Uh, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to answer them. So this is going to be a little weird, this video, where I'm going to uh, just kind of wing it. I don't have much planned out on this one. Uh, but let's look at the questions. Let's look at the questions. So uh, why don't metals have negative ions? That's pretty good question, isn't it? Because don't shouldn't there be situations where the metals can get their full valence shell easier by gaining by gaining uh, electrons under the uh, shell so we're going to talk about that but that also uh, goes in line with something else that we talked about which was when we talked about the multivalence ions or rather the multivalent uh, metals you see some of them they could be plus four or plus two and there's no plus three and and why not plus three and why not just lose all of them? Isn't the whole idea to get a full valence shell? So why aren't these things getting a full valence shell? So we're going we're gonna to tap a little bit into that. I'm not going to go too far into the answer on these things because it can get really, really complicated. But I want you to remember a few things before we move on. And uh, hopefully this will help kind of understand it is uh, you might have remember what I had asked before was, okay, say I've got a Bohr model here, and what does it mean for something to be reactive? What, what makes something reactive? This is a horrible Bohr model. What am I doing? So let's say I've got, um, I'm not sure what I've got here. I think I've got sodium about to come up here. Yeah, let's say this is sodium. I think I got sodium here. One. So why is this reactive and and i can immediately by looking at the bohr model say uh is this reactive yes very it is very reactive now how do i know this well the reason being is that in order to uh become stable i would just have to take that electron and kick it off that's all i would have to do i would i would be left with uh, then I would get, what would, what would happen? I would get this. Um, I'd still have two there. And then I'd have this one. And this atom would then be uh, have a nice, happy, filled eight electrons in its second shell. The, this electron's gone. So this, this, this shell that used to be here is now gone. And I've got this really nice situation. But why was it very reactive? And that's a different question. And I just want to, I'm hoping that all of you have really caught on to that, is that reactivity, reactivity means, what does this mean? It means uh, the lowest, um, it means, mm, uh, what shall I say? It means, <laughs> it means a very low amount, this sounds right, low amount of energy is needed. Whoops. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. Need it. Let, let, I want you to... Let, let, let me try to give something else that might help uh, even understand it even more. Let's say I've got um, a building... And then I, 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 and it's just a building. Here it is, just sitting down on the ground. And then I want to uh, push it over. And I know that if I push it over here, I'm going to push it over. Somehow I am, holy cow, I am, I am huge. I am a huge, huge person. And I am, um, I am pushing over this building because I know that when it falls, it'll, it'll go kaboom. And that'll be so much energy. Oh my God, look at all the energy that is made. And this is great. And so, um, but, but I, how much energy do I put in? Energy, energy in is needed to set this thing off. Energy in. And if I did it to this, it, it would probably take a pretty big push. But let's say I had a different building and I built this building, um, I, because I'm a horrible architect. So let's say the, a really stupid architect made this building and said, you know what, I want to build it on <laughs> on a single point because <laughs> uh, that was smart. And then another person comes and says, says, okay, 
Um, rawr, rawr. He's actually, you know what? He doesn't have to be angry. You know why? Because it doesn't need as much. How much energy do you need to tip this over? I mean, it's just, it's, it's ready to fall over already, isn't it? So energy in for this one. Um, actually here, uh, dooby doo. He's just whistling. Dooby doo. Yeah. Whistle, whistle. No problem. No problem. He's, he, he's just casual. He's just casual. No problem. And, but this person's like, ah, oh my God, I got, whoops. I got to push. Ah, and he's sweating. He's sweating. He's sweating because the energy into this one takes a lot more because uh, of the way this thing is structured and the way this one is structured. It, it's, it's, it's so little, so little, so easy. And I would say that this, uh, this building here is, I would call this a very reactive building. It's a very reactive building because it takes so little to get it going. And this is how I want you to think about it when we talk about the reactivity of the, of the atoms. We're looking at how little energy is needed to set ourselves into a more of a stable place. And uh, most of the time what we're talking about when we say stable place, we mean a full valence shell. Well, as it turns out, when we're dealing with certain things, um, the amount of energy needed uh, is not just about how many electrons are on the outer shell. This is what we've got so far. This, this is how much we understand this so far in our class and what we've been talking about. We say, well, look at this. When, when I look at the periodic table, in fact, here, let's just look at the periodic table. When I look at these uh, atoms here, uh, I can say, well, wait a minute. In this, in this entire group, I have one electron on the valence shell and it's so easy, so easy just to kick out that one electron that these are very, very reactive atoms. And as I go down, it gets even more reactive. And we can answer all these questions a lot to do with electrostatic forces. Because the reason why, say, cesium is way more reactive than, say, potassium is, well, let, let's go back to it, is that really what we're saying, let me go back to my Photoshop, is that the difference between cesium and potassium is that where the valence shell is. So with, say, potassium, it's, uh, here's my, uh, let me go back. I don't even know how many. Potassium is in the fourth. So let's just, I'm not going to draw all these, but let's just simply say one, uh, two, three. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> this is the worst. Okay, this is... <laughs> This is a pretty bad atom, but uh, just just deal with it. Okay, so my valence shell, here's my electron, and uh, it can get kicked off, no problem. Uh, this is this is shell number four. Uh, but let's go back, cesium. What do you got? What do you got for me, cesium? Cesium six. So uh, CS is cesium. So one, two. What did I say it was six? I don't even remember. I just looked at it. Oh my god, six. One, two. Three, four, five, six. All right. So the question is, which one is easier to kick off? Is it just simply because there's one electron on the valence shell? Well, yes, but there's one other thing we're forgetting about. And that's the fact that there is an attractive force that keeps the electron there. And that is the attractive force between the positive nuclei and the negative, the opposite charge of the electron itself, which means how strong is the force now for this one? Well, it's weaker. It's it's weaker. Why? Well, because it's farther away. It's on a farther shell. And each time I add a shell, the distance gets astronomically farther, which means this force that's keeping it on is so much weaker. Therefore, far less energy needed to kick this thing off. Therefore, this is more reactive, more reactive because there's less force to fight against. There's, there's less energy needed, less energy needed to set this thing in motion, just like I was saying. So what, what does this have to do with anything that we were asking here? Well, let's get into it. Now, when you look at this, you go hydrogen. 
great. And I go to helium, you go, great. And I go to lithium and, and you go, okay, great. Now there's two shells. And if you look at the, um, let me see if I can click on this. If you look, whoops, whoa. If you look at, <laughs> click on you, stay there, stay there. It's not going to stay there. Okay. Just trust me. Look over here when I'm talking at this thing over here. Now, if I look at lithium, you can see I got two nice shells. But does it stay that way? And, and if you've played around with this, you'll notice that as we start adding shells, and specifically when I start dealing with the metals in the middle, let's just start looking what happens. And I go, oh, that doesn't look like a shell anymore. What the hell is going on? And then I start showing you more and more and say, whoa, what is that, a donut? And so what does this mean? What we're trying to say is that orbits are not just shells that look like spheres. Let's just keep going. Look at this thing. Look at this thing. So what's happening, and if I go further down, then, woo, this is groovy. Look at this thing. Oh, my God. So what are we saying? We're saying that the orbits actually have different distances and different geometries from each other. So... This might not be the total answer that you want, but I'm just giving you kind of a hint of what's going on. The ability for something to become an ion is its ability to very easily react and become that ion. In other words, I need low amounts of energy to do that. And as it turns out, for, say, something like iron, to basically lose one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, to lose seven electrons or eight electrons, and become stable is not even close to the low amount of energy just to lose two or three. And it it's not even just because losing two or three or four is easy. It's also because of the geometry. In some cases, these orbitals are actually much further out than other ones. And that distance away from the nuclei gives it um, a weaker force and therefore an easier job of falling out. But that doesn't mean the next one that could be taken out is actually even close to the other one. Because the way we've drawn it so far, like what have we drawn? We're, we're, we're drawing all of our atoms in the same way so far. We've always said, okay, so what do you got? Oh, you got a nuclei and then you got, let me see, and then you got an orbit like this. And th and therefore, the next orbits, well, they're farther away. And therefore, it's weaker. Well, not so. It doesn't really look like this. This is, uh, I'm, I'm only giving you a little bit of the story here. Because really what's going on is that the, the it's really something like where I have, yeah, maybe it looks like this. But then afterwards, it kind of looks like, looks like this. And then, and then there's kind of like other stuff like this. And sometimes things look like a donut. And, and so the shape of these shells and the, and the directions that these orbits take really affects how easy it is to get rid of them. And so I know some of this you're going to just have to trust me on. I'm saying, hey, just trust me. The orbitals are going to be affecting how closely they connect to each other, how closely they bond and stay connected and how easy it is to get rid of them So and therefore how reactive it is. But what it means, though, is that things like iron and all these multivalent electrons right down here in the middle, all of these around here, can only lose so many before they become actually pretty, pretty strongly connected. The, uh, the electrons stay connected and are really, it takes too much energy to simply lose them. And as it turns out, it is always way less energy to lose as opposed to gain. So there's a reason why we never see uh, the atoms of metal ever becoming positive, sorry, negative ions. In other words, they gain electrons. It's because it is just too much energy to get them in. It's just too much energy. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, we've done it many times in the lab. In, in a laboratory situation, you can create negative ions we do it all the time with silver actually silver uh, often is made into a negative ag negative we can do it but what we see here when we're talking about the ions as listed on the uh, on this on this uh periodic table and you, and you see them listed here see them see there we have one two three four five three and six two four seven two three two three what we're seeing here 
is what happens naturally. So naturally, because it's always a choice of what takes the least amount of energy, we always are going to uh, be picking these as our naturally occurring ions. Not to say that we can't do it unnaturally. And, and I, I, I'm hesitating to say the word unnaturally. But really, in a laboratory uh, conditions, we can do these things. Of course we can. But that means we would have to put energy into the system that wouldn't naturally occur. We have to kind of uh, change the conditions by which it would happen. And that's how we get that stuff. Uh, hopefully that kind of answers the question. I don't know what the next questions are. So uh, I will move on very quickly to the next question. See ya.